Hello. Well, I'm sitting in the Festival Theatre in the middle of a production of uh, Paul Gallico's Snow Goose, which, of course, is a short story which we've adapted for the stage. W one of the reasons for choosing that is that many years ago, when I was 15 or 16 at a drama course, in the evening, well, actors came and performed for us. And one of the actors, whose name, I'm, fortunately, I can't remember, came and did the Snow Goose, where he, he told the story and, and he read all the parts. And it, it sort of stayed in my mind. And, and over the years, I've always wanted to to try to adapt it for the stage. And funnily enough, it's this pandemic that's given me that, this opportunity. So uh, we're going to film this, as well as, you, of course, you can see it live. So I, I hope you're going to enjoy this very moving piece. It's set against the backdrop of the war. It's about friendship. It's about self-sacrifice. It's about disability. And at the end, it's about love. It's been a very difficult year, of which all of you have helped enormously in, in our fundraising uh, to make sure that we're in a strong position. We've had help also from the Arts Council, from the local authority. Uh, and I thank everyone who's contributed and, and hope you will continue to do so because we're not out of the woods yet, but we are going to be here and we're going to come back strongly, hopefully sometime between April and September. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoy it. We shall fight in France, we shall fight on the seas and oceans, we shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air, we shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be, we shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender, and if which I do not for a moment believe this island or a large part of it was subjugated and starving then our empire beyond the seas armed and guarded by the British fleet would carry on the struggle until in God's good time the new world with all its power and might steps forth to the rescue and the liberation of the old
The Great Marsh lies in the Essex coast, between the village of Chelmbury and the ancient Saxon fishing hamlet of Wickledroth. It is one of the few remaining wild lands of England, a low, far-reaching expanse of grass and reeds and half-submerged meadowlands, ending in a great salting and tidal pools and mudflats against the restless sea. Tidal creeks and estuaries and the crooked meandering arms of many little rivers whose mouths lap at the edge of the ocean, cut through the sodden land that seems to rise and fall and breathe with the recurrence of the daily tides. It is desolate, utterly lonely, and made lonelier by the calls and cries of the wildfowl that make their homes in the marshlands and saltings, the wild geese and the gulls, the teal and widgeon, the red shanks and curlews that pick their way through the tidal pools. Of human inhabitants, there are none, and none are seen, with the occasional exception of a wild fowler or native oyster fisherman, who still ply a trade already ancient when the Normans came to Hastings. Greys, blues and soft greens are the colour. For when the skies are dark in the long winters, the many waters of the beaches and marshes reflect the cold and sombre colour. But sometimes, at sunrise and sunset, skies and land are aflame with red and golden fire. Hard by one of the winding arms of the little river Elder runs the embankment of an old sea wall, smooth and solid, without a break, a bulwark to the land against the encroaching sea, deep into a salting some three miles from the English Channel. It turns north. At this corner, its face is gouged and broken and shattered, for it has been breached and at the breach, the hungry sea has already taken for its own the land, the wall, and all that stood there. At low water, the blackened and ruptured stones of the ruins of an abandoned lighthouse show above the surface. With here and there, like boy markers, the top of a sagging fence post. Once. This lighthouse abutted on the sea was a beacon on the Essex coast. Time shifted land and water, and its usefulness came to an end. Lately, it served again as a human habitation. In it, there lived a lonely man, his body was warped, but his heart was filled with love for wild and hunted things. He was ugly to look upon, but he created great beauty. It is about him and about a child who came to know him to what lay within that this story is told. It's not a story that falls easily or smoothly into sequence. It's been garnered from many sources and from many people. Some of it comes in the form of fragments from men who looked upon strange and violent scenes. For the sea has claimed its own and spreads its rippled blanket over the site. And the great white bird with the black tip pinions that saw it all from the beginning to the end has returned to the dark frozen silences of the Northlands whence it came. In the late spring of 1930, Philip Ryder came to the abandoned lighthouse at the mouth of the Elder. He bought the light and many acres of salting and marshland surrounding it. He lived and worked there alone all year round. He was a painter of birds and of nature who, for reasons, 
had withdrawn from all human society. Some of those reasons were apparent on his fortnightly visits to the little village of Chelmbury for supplies, where the natives looked askance at his misshapen body and dark visage. For he was a hunchback, and his left arm was thin, crippled and bent at the wrist like the claw of a bird. They soon became used to his queer figure, small but powerful. The massive head set just slightly below the mysterious mound on his back, the glowing eyes and the clawed hand. They marked him off as that queer painted chap that lives down to Lighthouse. Physical deformity often breeds hatred of humanity and men. Ryder did not hate. He loved very greatly. Man, the animal kingdom and all of nature. His heart was filled with pity and understanding. He had come to master his handicap but he could not master the rebuffs he suffered due to his appearance. The thing that drove him into seclusion was his failure to find anywhere a return for the warmth that flowed from him. He repelled women. Men would have warmed to him had they got to know him, but the mere fact an effort was being made hurt Ryder and drove him to avoid the person making it. He was 27 when he came to the Great Marsh. He had travelled much and fought valiantly before he made the decision to withdraw from a world in which he could not take part as other men. For all the artist's sensitivity and woman's tenderness locked in his barrel breast, he was very much a man. In his retreat, he had his birds, his paintings, and his boat. He owned a 16-footer, which he sailed with wonderful skill. Alone, with no eyes to watch him. He managed well with his deformed hand, and would often use his strong teeth to handle the sheet of his billowing sails in a tricky blow. He would sail tidal creeks and estuaries and out to sea and would be gone for days at a time, looking for new species of birds to photograph or sketch. And he became an adept at netting them to add to his collection of tamed wildfowl that he kept in the pen near his studio that formed the nucleus of a sanctuary. He never shot over a bird, and the wildfowlers were not welcome near his premises. He was a friend to all things wild, and the wild things repaid him with their friendship. Tamed in his enclosures were the wild geese that came winging down the coast from Iceland and Spitsberg in each October, in great schemes that darkened the skies and filled the air with the rushing noise of their passage. The brown-bodied pink feet, white-breasted barnacles with their dark necks and clown's masks, wild white fronts and black barred breasts and many species of wild duck, mallard, widgeon, pintail, teal and shovelers. Some were pinioned so that they remained there as a sign and signal to the wild ones that came winging down each winter's beginning that here were food and sanctuary. Many hundreds came and remained with him all through the cold weather, from October to early spring, when they migrated north again to their breeding grounds below the ice rim. Ryder was content with the knowledge that when storms blew, or it was bitter cold and food was scarce, or when the big punt guns of the distant bag hunters roared, his birds were safe, that he had gathered to the security and sanctuary of his own arms and heart, these many wild and beautiful creatures who knew and trusted him. They would answer the call of the north in the spring, but in the fall they would come back, barking and whooping and honking in the autumn sky. 
birds that he well remembered and recognised him from the previous year. And this made Ryder happy because he knew implanted somewhere in the beings was the germ knowledge of his existence and his safe haven. That this knowledge had become a part of them and with the coming of the grey skies and the winds from the north would send them unerringly back to him. For the rest, my heart and soul went into painting the country in which I lived and its creatures. There are not many riders extant. I hoarded them jealously, piling them in my stock rooms and in my lighthouse by the hundreds. For as an artist, well, I was uncompromising. But the few that reached the markets were masterpieces, filled with the joy and colour of marsh reflected light, the feel of flight, the push of birds breasting a morning wind, bending the tall flag reeds. He painted the loneliness and the smell of the salt laden cold, the eternity and agelessness of marshes, wild living creatures, dawn flights and frightened things taking to the air, and winged shadows at night hiding from the moon. One November afternoon, Three years after I came to the Great Marsh, a child approached the lighthouse by means of the sea wall. In her arms, she carried a burden. She was no more than 12, dirty, slender, timid and nervous as a bird. But beneath the grime was as eerily beautiful as the Marsh Fairy. She was pure Saxon, large-boned, dark hair, head to which her body was yet to grow, and deep-set, sparkling brown eyes. She was terribly frightened of this ugly man who she'd come to see, for legend had already begun to spin about me, and the wild fowlers hated me for interfering with their sport. But greater than her fear was the need of which she bore. For locked in her child's heart was the knowledge, picked up somewhere in the swamplands that in the lighthouse lived an ogre who could heal injured things. What is it, child? I found it, sir. It's hurted. Is it still alive? Y yes, yes, I, I think it is, yes. Come in, come in. Where did you find it? In the marshes, sir. Where the fowlers had been. It's a snow goose from Canada. But how in heaven has it come to be here? C can he heal it, sir? Yes, yes, I think we can. Come, you shall help me. Ah, she's been shot, poor thing. Her leg is broken and this wingtip, but not too badly. See? First, we shall clip her primary so that in the spring the feathers will grow back and she will be able to fly again. Then, 
We shall bandage the wing close to her body so that she cannot move and make a splint for the poor leg. This bird is a young one, no more than a year old. She was born in a northern land, a land far across the sea, a land belonging to England. When she was in flight, a great storm must have seized her and whirled and buffeted her around. It must have been a truly terrible storm, stronger than her great wings, stronger than anything. And she had no choice but to fly before it. When finally it had blown itself out, she was over a different land, surrounded by strange birds, ones that she had never seen before. Exhausted after her ordeal, she had settled in a friendly green marsh, only to be met by the blast of a hunter's gun. A bitter reception for our visiting princess. We shall call her La Princess Berju, the lost princess. And in a few weeks she will be much better. See? What is your name, child? Frith. Eh? Fritha, I suppose. Where do you live? With the fisher folk. At Wickledroth. Will you be returning tomorrow to see how the princess is getting along? I am. The snow goose mended rapidly, and by midwinter was already mingling with the pink footed geese of which she associated, rather than the barnacle geese, and had learned to come to be fed at my call. And the child, Frith or Fritha, yes, she had become a, a frequent visitor of mine. I'll help you. She'd overcome her fear of me. For locked in her child's imagination was this great white creature from a land far across the sea. A land that was all pink. And one that I showed her. On a map. As we traced out the snow goose's journey from Canada to the great marsh of Essex. Then one June morning, a group of late pink feet, fat and well fed from the winter at the lighthouse, answered the stronger call of the breeding ground and rose lazily, climbing into the sky in their ever widening circles. With them, her white body and black tip pinions shining in the spring sun, was the snow goose. It so happened that Frith was at the lighthouse. The cry of the goose brought Frith and Ryder running from the studio. Look! Look at the princess! Ah, the princess is going home! Listen, she is bidding us farewell!
With the departure of the snow goose sending Fritz visits to the lighthouse, I learned all over again the meaning of the word loneliness. That summer, out of my memory, I painted a picture. A picture of a grime-covered girl, her hair tussled by the November storm, and holding in her arms a wounded white bird. In mid-October, the miracle occurred. Ryder was in his enclosure, feeding the birds. A grey northeast wind was blowing, and the land was sighing beneath the incoming tide. Above the sea and wind noises, he heard a high, clear note. He turned his eyes up towards the evening sky in time to see first an infinite speck, then a black and white pinion dream that circled the lighthouse once, and finally a reality that dropped to earth in the pen and came waddling forward importantly to be fed as though she had never been away. It was the Snow Goose. There was no mistaking her. Tears of joy came to Ryder's eyes. Where had she been? Surely not home to Canada. No, she must have summered in Greenland or Spitsbergen with the pink feet. She had remembered and returned. When next I went into Chelmbury for supplies, I left a message with the postmistress. One that must have caused much bewilderment. I said, tell Frith, who lives with the fisher folk at Wickledrop, that the lost princess has returned. Three days later, Frith, taller, still tussled and unkempt, came shyly to the lighthouse to visit La Princess Berdieu. Time passed. On the great marsh it was marked by the height of the tides, the slow march of the seasons, the passage of the birds, and for them, by the arrival and departure of the snow goose. The world outside boiled and seethed and rumbled with the eruption that would soon break forth and come close to marking its destruction. But not yet did it touch upon Ryder, or for that matter, Frith. They had fallen into a curious natural rhythm, even as the child grew older. When the snow goose was at the lighthouse, then she came too, to visit and learn many things from Ryder. They sailed together in his speedy boat, which he handled so skillfully. They caught wildfowl for the ever-increasing colony and built new pens and enclosures for them. From him, she learned the law of every wild bird, from gull to gear falcon that flew the marshes. I helped him sometimes and even learnt to mix his paint. But when the snow goose returned home for the summer, 
It was like a bar was up between us and you did not visit the lighthouse. One year the bird did not return and Philip was heartbroken. All things seemed to have ended for him. He painted furiously through the winter and the next summer and never once saw Frith. But in the fall, the familiar cry once more rang from the sky and the huge white bird, now at its full growth, dropped from the sky as mysteriously as it had departed. Joyously, Philip sailed his boat into Chelmbury and left a message with the postmistress. Curiously, it was more than a month after he had left the message before Frith reappeared at the lighthouse. And Ryder, with a shock, realized she was a child no longer. After the year in which the bird remained away, its periods of absence grew shorter and shorter. It grew so tame that it would follow Ryder about and even came into his studio while he was working. In the spring of 1940, the birds migrated early from the Great Marsh. The world was on fire. The whine and roar of the bombers and the thudding explosions frightened them. Philip! Philip! Look, Philip! Ryder followed her eyes. The snow goose had taken flight. Her giant wings spread, but she was flying low and once came quite close to them, so that for a moment the black-tipped white pinions seemed to caress them and they felt the rush of the bird's swift passage. Once, twice, she circled the lighthouse, then dropped down to the earth again, into the enclosure with the pinioned geese, and commenced to feed. She be ain't going. The princess be going to stay. Ah, she'll stay. She will never go away again. The lost princess is lost no more. This is her home now. Of her own free will. The spell the bird had woven about me was broken. And I was suddenly conscious of the fact that I was frightened. And the thing that frightened me was in Philip's eyes. The longing and the loneliness and the deep welling unspoken things that lay in and behind them. His last words were repeating themselves in my head, as though he had said them again. This is her home now, of her own free will. The delicate tendrils of my instincts reached to him 
and carried to me the message of the things he could not speak because of what he felt himself to be. Misshapen and grotesque. And where his voice might have soothed me, my fright grew greater at his silence and the power of the unspoken things between us. The woman in me bade me to take flight from something I was not yet capable of understanding. I must go. Goodbye. I'd be glad that the princess will stay. You'll not be so alone now. Goodbye. Brie. She was far away before she dared turn for a backward glance. He was still standing on the sea wall, a dark speck against the sky. Her fear had stilled now. It had been replaced by something else, a queer sense of loss that made her stand quite still just for a moment. So sharp was it. Then, more slowly, she continued on, away from the skyward pointing finger of the lighthouse and the man beneath it. A number of appeals for recruits have been issued today. The Admiralty want men experienced in marine internal combustion engines for service as enginemen in yachts or motorboats. Others who have had charge of motorboats and have good knowledge of coastal navigation are needed as uncertified second hands. Application should be made to the nearest registrar, Royal Naval Reserve, or to the fishery officer. It was a little over a month before Frith returned to the lighthouse. May was at its end, and the day too, with the long golden sun replaced by the silver of the moon hanging in the eastern sky.
Frith told herself, as her steps took her thither, that she must know if the snow goose had really stayed, as Ryder said it would. Perhaps it had flown away after all. But her firm tread on the sea wall was full of eagerness, and sometimes, unconsciously, she found herself hurrying. Philip, you be going away. Ah, oh, Frith, I am glad you came. Yes, yes, I, m I must go away. A little trip. I will be back. Where must you go? I must go to Dunkirk. A hundred miles across the channel. Men are stranded on the beaches there. Hunted by the advancing German army. The port is in flames. The position is perilous. I can go in my boat. It can take six men at a time at a pinch, seven. I can make many trips from the beaches to the transporters. Philip, why must you go? You'll not come back. Men are like hunted birds, Frith. Like the hunted and wounded birds we used to find and bring to sanctuary. Over them fly steel peregrines and gear falcons. They have no protection from those iron birds of prey. They are lost and storm-driven and harried. Like the, like the Princess Bird, you, you brought me out of the marshes all those years ago. And we healed her. They need help, my dear. Just like those wounded birds needed help. And that is why I must go. Yes. It is something that I can do. Yes, I can. For once, I can be a man, and I can play my part. He has changed so. He is no longer ugly, or misshapen, or grotesque. but very beautiful. Philip, I'll come with you. Oh, Your place in the boat would cause another man to be left behind. And another. And another. I'm sorry. But I must go alone. Goodbye. Will you look after my birds until I return? Frith. God speed you. I will take care of the birds. God speed you, Philip. I stood on the sea wall and watched the sail gliding down the swollen estuary. 
Suddenly, from the darkness behind me, came a rush of wings and something swept past me into the air. In the night light, I saw the flash of white wings, black tipped, and the thrust forward head of the snow goose. It rose and cruised over the lighthouse once, and then headed down the winding creek to where Philip's sail was slanting in the gaining breeze, and flew above it in slow, wide circles. White sail and white bird. Watch over him. Watch over him. A goose! A blooming goose about me. A goose it was. Jock here seed it same as me. It come flying down out of the muck and stink and smoke of Dunkirk that was overhead. It was white with black on its wings and it circled us like a blooming dive bomber. Oh. Jock here, he says, we're done for. It's the angel of death for come for us. Gun, I says. It's a ruddy goose. Come over from home with a message from Churchill. And how are we enjoying the blooming bathing? <laughs> it's an omen. That's what it is. A blooming omen. We'll get out of this yet, me lad. We were roosting on the beaches between Dunkirk and La Panny, like a lot of blooming pigeons on Victoria Embankment, just waiting for Jerry to pot us. He potted us good too. He's behind us and flanking us and above us. He give us shrapnel and he give us eight G and he peppers us from the blooming atmosphere with jitter smiths. And offshore, it's the Kentish Maid, a ruddy excursion scow. Well, I've taken many a trip on out of Margate in the summer for two and six, just waiting there to take us off half a mile out from the blooming shallows. And whilst we're, we're lying there oh, on the beach, done in and cursing, because there ain't no way to get out to that boat, a stuka dives on her. And his bombs drop alongside of her, throwing up the water like the blooming fountains in the palace gardens. A regular display it was. Then a destroyer comes up and says, Nay, I don't you, the Stuka, with ack and pom poms, but. Then another Jerry dives on the destroyer. And it's a. God, does she go up? 
and the smoke and the stink come drifting in shore, all yellow and black. And then out of it comes this blooming goose circling around us, trapped on the beach. And then, around a bend, he comes in, in a blooming little sailboat, just sailing along, as cool as you please. You know, like a blooming toff out for a pleasure spin on a Sunday afternoon at Enley. <laughs> Who comes? Him. Him that saved a lot of us. He sailed clean for a boil and machine gun bullets from a jerry in a jitter smith what was strafing. A Ramsgate motorboat what had tried to take us off had been sunk there half an hour ago. The water was all frothing with shell splashes and bullets, but he didn't give it no mind, he didn't. He didn't have no petrol to burn or explode, and he sailed in between the shells. Into the shallows he comes, like the dark smoke of the burning destroyer. A little man with a, a blooming claw for an hand, and an ump on his back. He had a rope in his teeth that was shining white. His good hand on the tiller and his crooked one, beckoning us to come. And overhead, around and around, fly the ruddy goose. Jockey, he says, look, it's the bloody devil come for us himself. I must have been struck down and don't know it. Gone, I says. It's more like the good Lord, it looks to me, than any blooming devil. He did too. You know, like the pictures in the Sunday school books, with his white face and dark eyes, and his blooming boat. I could take seven at a time, he sings out when he's in close. Our officer shouts, good man, you seven nearest. Get in! We waded out to where he was. I was that weary, I couldn't climb over the side. But he grabs me by the collar of me tunic and pulls me in you go, lad. Come on, next man! And in I went. God, he was strong, he was. Then he sets his sail. Part of one looks like a blooming sieve with machine gun bullets and shouts, Keep down the bottom of the boat, boys, in case you meet any of your friends. And then we're off. Him sitting in the stern, with a bit of rope in his teeth, another in his crooked claw, and his good hand on the tiller, steering and sailing for the spray and shells thrown by a land battery somewhere back on the coast. And the goose is flying overhead. Onking above the wind and the row Jerry was making, like a blooming Morris 8 on Winchester Bypass. I told a young goose was an omen, I says to Jock. Look it in there, a blooming angel of mercy. Him at the tiller just looks up at the bird with the rope in his teeth and grins at her like he knows her a lifetime. He brings us out to the Kentish maid, then turns round and goes back for another load. He made trips all afternoon and all night too, because the light of Dunkirk burning was bright enough to see by. I don't know how many trips he made, but him and a Nobby Thames Yacht Club motorboat and a big lifeboat from Paul that came along brought off all there was of us on that particular stretch of hell. Without the loss of a man. We sailed when the last man was off. And there was more than 700 of us aboard a boat built to take 200. He was still there when we left. And he waved us goodbye and sailed back towards Dunkirk. The bird with him. Blimey. It was queer to see that ruddy big goose ride flying around his boat, lit up by the fires like a, like a white angel against the smoke. A stuka had another go at us halfway across, but he'd been staying up late nights and missed. By morning, 
we were safe home. I never did find out what become of him or who he was. In with the ump and his little sailboat. Bloody good man he was, that chap. <laughs> A ruddy big goose. What you know? A curtain of darkness hangs over the coast of Britain. The dark shadow of ships flash their signals to the shore. As dawn breaks, Pathy Gazette's cameraman is on a tiny merchant ship. He is risking his life to bring you the pictures. He is on his way to Dunkirk. Every few seconds he sees other ships returning, ships of all shapes and sizes, manned by sailors and merchantmen of wireless operators are at their posts. Each ship is filled with the men of the BEF and of the French army in Flanders. They are on their way home, home from the hell that is Dunkirk. Since these pictures were taken, we have all heard the full story from the Prime Minister of how the Royal Navy, using nearly a thousand ships, has brought back nearly 350,000 men. Now you are off burning Dunkirk. Now you are to see that evacuation in progress. You will see the Navy in action, Nazi planes overhead. You will see the beaches of Dunkirk under enemy fire, our own guns replying. You will see the calm waters dotted with hundreds of men as they wade or swim out to the ships. Here in pictures is the triumph that turned a major military disaster into a miracle of deliverance. A naval reserve officer who had two Brixham trawlers and the Yarmouth Drifter blasted out from under him in the last four days of the evacuation said, did you run across that queer sort of legend about a wild goose? It was up all and down the beaches. You know how these things spring up. Some of the men I brought back were talking about it. It was supposed to have appeared at intervals the last days between Dunkirk and La Pan. They said if you saw it, you were eventually saved. That kind of thing. Hmm, said Brill. A wild goose? Well, I saw a tame one. Dash strange experience. Tragic in a way, too. And lucky for us. Tell you about it. Third trip back, towards six o'clock, we sighted a derelict small boat. Seemed to be a chap or a body in her. And a bird perched on the rail. Well, we changed course when we got nearer and went over for a look-see. By God, it was a chap. Or had been, poor fellow. Machine gunned, you know. Badly. Face down in the water. The bird was a goose, a tame one. Well, we drifted in close, but when one of our chaps reached over, the bird hissed at him and struck it in with her wings. Couldn't drive it off. Suddenly, young Kettering gives a hail and points to starboard. Big mine floating by. If we'd kept on our course, we'd have ploughed right into it. Well, we'd had to get a hundred yards astern of the last barge. Then the men blew it up with rifle fire. When we turned our attention towards the small boat again, she had gone, sunk, chap with her. He must have been lashed to her. The bird had got up and was circling three times like a plane, saluting. Dash queer feeling. Then she flew off to the west. Lucky thing for us, we went over to have a look, eh? Odd that you should mention a goose. I remained alone at the little lighthouse on the Great Marsh, taking care of the pinion birds and waiting for I know not what. The first day, I haunted the sea wall watching. Later, I roamed through the storerooms of the lighthouse building with the stacks of canvases on which Philip had captured every mood and light of the desolate country. And the graceful, wondrous feathered things that inhabited it. Among them, I found the picture Philip had painted of me 
from memory so many years ago when I was still a child and stood timid and windblown at his threshold. Hugging an injured bird to me. The picture and the things she saw in it stirred her as nothing ever had before, for much of Ryder's soul had gone into it. Strangely, it was only the second time he had painted the snow goose. The lost, wild creature, storm-driven from another land, that to each had brought a friend, and in the end returned to her with the knowledge that she would never see him again. Long before the snow goose had come dropping out of the crimsoned eastern sky, to circle the lighthouse in a final farewell. Fritha, from the ancient power of the blood that was within her, knew that Ryder would not return. And so, when one sunset, she heard the high-pitched, well-remembered note cried from the heavens. It brought no instant of false hope to our heart. This moment, it seemed, she had lived before. Many times. She went running to the sea wall and turned her eyes not toward the distant channel whence a sail might come, but in the sky from whose flaming arches plummeted the snow goose. Then the sight, the sound and the solitude surrounding broke the dam within her and released a surging, overwhelming truth of her love. Let it well forth in tears. Wild spirit called to wild spirit. Brith! Britha! Brith, my love! Goodbye, my love! Philip! For a moment, Frith thought that the snow goose was going to land in the old enclosure as the pinioned geese set up a welcoming gabble. But it only soared low, then flew high into the sky into a graceful glide once round the lighthouse and then began to climb. Watching it, Frith no longer saw the snow goose but the soul of Ryder, taking farewell of her before departing forever. She was no longer flying with it, but earthbound. She stretched her arms up into the sky, stood on tiptoes, reaching, and cried, God speed! God speed, Philip! Each night, 
for many weeks thereafter, I came to the lighthouse and fed the pinion birds. Then one early morning, a German pilot on a dawn raid mistook the old abandoned light for an inactive military objective, dived onto it, a screaming steel hawk, and blew it and all it contained into oblivion. That evening, when Fritha came, the sea had already breached the walls and covered it over. Nothing was left to break the utter desolation. No marsh fowl had dared to return. Only the frightless gulls wheeled and soared and mewed their plaint where it had once been. So that's Paul Gallico's Snow Goose. I, I really hope you enjoyed this very moving tale. Thank you for watching. Um, as you know, we've done this for free, but don't let that stop you donating. All the information is, uh, is on the page. And I look forward to seeing you at the theatre very shortly. Thank you. <laughs>